Well, welcome everyone. I've got uh, Sarah Moss with me joining me today on our channel of Your True Self. And Sarah is a kinesiologist that I've met previously when I was living in Broome and uh, is such a beautiful soul. And so I wanted to bring Sarah on to be able to talk to you a bit about, um, you know, some of the options out there, some of the different modalities that are available and um, perhaps a bit about Sarah's journey that she's she's trekked across Australia to make it and break it in Broome and now into Derby. Um, so, yeah, welcome, Sarah. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, Deb. So, Sarah, I met you, what, a couple of years ago, is it, already? Yes, I moved to Broome in February 2019, maybe. 2019? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that sounds about right. So, yeah. um, and, you know, you've done some amazing work with your kinesiology and I know that you've come from an interesting background and you had a bit of a gap year and made it to Broome <laughs> all on your own. And um, so, yeah, I just thought it'd be really interesting to see how and why you did that and and how you got through all those changes in life and you yeah and just some of the interesting stuff that you've done well i don't think i'm particularly interesting but um but <laughs> it, it all came about like my youngest daughter finished grade 12 in 2018 and she was going to do a gap year on a cattle station in the northern territory my eldest daughter had done a couple of years up here when she left school and I don't know, I was just feeling in a bit of a rut in Toowoomba. I guess my marriage was getting a bit old and stale. So I thought I should, I was reading actually a Di Morrissey book about Broome. And I thought, oh my God, I love Broome. Maybe I should go there. So I had one voice on one shoulder saying, what a great idea. The other voice going, that is so irresponsible. <laughs> you absolutely can't do that. My eldest daughter was going to go to America and study. And so I actually wasn't going to have any kids in Queensland. So I packed up my little car and um, my daughter drove her car to the territory, the station she was on. I drove my car with my kinesiology stuff and enough, well, as much as I could fit in really, which was not much, um, and drove to Broome and, yeah, started there. I, I, the market research I did was I rang a massage therapist to ask if he had a room and did he think a kinesiologist would go well in Broome? <laughs> and he said, if you're any good, it will. If you're not, it won't. So yeah. <laughs> that was the extent of my market research. And I really didn't have anything to lose because if I hated it, yeah. I could just do a U-turn and travel 5,500 kilometres back. So how did you actually so, decide which one I've loved to it's been a Well, I think my irresponsible voice convinced my responsible voice that I really had nothing to lose by doing it except 11,000 k's driving if it didn't work out. Okay. So I just did it. And then I remember got to the mangrove because we set meals up on her station, Avern over a few days and she drove with me to Broome and we went to the mangrove and then it hit me and I went, oh, my God, what have I done? I'm living in a town where I don't know a soul, far out, and I remember bursting into tears going, I'm absolutely insane. Um, and then I put meals on the plane about a week later and she flew back to Kaminara to start her, her cattle station work and I started working in Broome and that was it and I've, I've loved... Well, nearly every minute. Of, I don't think anyone loves every minute of everything, but no, it's been fantastic. And, um, and now I was renting a beautiful home and the owner comes back for the wet season, uh, the dry season, which meant I had to move out and there's no rental properties in Broome. So I found a house in Derby and I'm still living in Boxland a little bit. Um, so, yeah, here I am. Yeah, it's all and I now have a lot thing. more crap. And it doesn't all fit in my car anymore. <laughs> so that's it's actually um, a really brave thing yeah, to do. Yeah, so, so here I am in Derby. Now. Wow. Yeah, I, I actually think it's really brave. Like, um, Yeah, change can be scary, but if you weigh it up, what really have you got to lose? Hmm. Um, you know, if you've got a good fallback plan, and I could have just turned around and driven back to Queensland and, and things, but, you know, there really wasn't anything to lose. I don't know. And, and I think sometimes we're scared of demons, and I think as women too we have an extra DNA strand to catastrophize. So we do the whole what if thing. What if I have no friends? What if I can't make a living? What if I can't do this? What if I can't? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if I get a flat tyre? But you know what? You've got a spare tyre. If things don't work out, you you know, I wasn't moving to Alaska or something, so <laughs> there really wasn't that much risk. And I am a, um, I am a, I love strategy and analysing things. And really, when I was sensible, there really wasn't that much of a risk. The worst thing was that I, I, 
I had a holiday in Broome and drove back. Yeah, yeah. And so how did you actually make that kind of break as well? You know, a lot of people, if they've been in a marriage for a long time and they're, that can be quite confronting to have to leave that. How did, how did you feel that you kind of dealt with that or worked through that? Um, well, it was actually my husband that decided he didn't want to be married anymore. Okay. We were going down two completely different life paths. He was completely passionate and his business was his probably main love in his life. And I kept getting sucked into that business. My passion, kinesiology, was only a hobby. Mm. And I guess I didn't want to split things up while we had kids at school. Um, we still get on. He came over for Christmas to see the girls and he actually ended up staying at my house in the spare room for a few nights. And, mm-hmm. you know, so it's, I don't know, just these, some things just come to an end and it's came to an end. Mm. Do you wish it came to an end earlier, like in the sense of, um, you know, with your, your girls and, um, you know, do you think it would have been better if you, I mean, not that you can change the past, but do you reckon it would have been better to go earlier or you think it's really you, you kind of went with the way I don't know. The universe I, works out. I don't know. That's a, a really hard one. I, I came from a, I came from a broken family, mm. and that was back in the seventies. Divorce was really, really rare back then, and and mm. you know, so were gay people, and and I think people pointed out the gay people, and they pointed out the girl from the divorced parents. You know, that's how odd it was. Um, I wasn't one of the weird ones whose parents are still together back, you know, like it is now. So. Yeah. I, I guess I really didn't want that for my kids and my mum had a real struggle being on her own because we had yeah. a farm and we had a horse stud and a cattle stud and, you know, so she had a lot on her plate and ended up getting cancer and having a nervous breakdown and all sorts of things like that happened. And I guess, you know, we have our own belief systems and I guess mine was it's too scary for the kids if the marriage breaks up. So yeah. um, my husband and I didn't hate each other. I guess the love had just gone out of the relationship. So um, we we just went our separate ways and... Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that I would do it differently. Yeah, yeah. What can you do anyway? You can't really change it and you need to allow the, I guess for me, I suppose the universe always gets it all the timing right, but it, you can do that mm-hmm. as women, that what if, or maybe I should have done that or so, yeah. And so you, yeah. with, so, um, so your passion was kinesiology. Yeah. You went off and you, because you, you're a bit of a um, wild farm girl, you know, wrangled horses and done all sorts of so if you girls so they've they've been able to do quite what would be out of the box for most yeah most women um they're pretty do some pretty amazing stuff so what brought you into kinesiology um i actually got really really sick i traveled through indonesia in about 1989 or 90 and i ended up having getting salmonella and kept traveling and drinking which was actually probably not very smart I probably would do that differently if I could (laughs) go back and do it again but we were meeting some friends at the German beer festival in September so you know what do you do and so I got to England and I got really sick so I had to come home and it turned out that I had pancreatitis and I was really really unwell and then I went back to South America did six months in South America the following year and came back and um, worked in the gold mines actually in WA for a while. And then yeah. I, I did six months in South America and mainly on, on sheep stations there because we had contacts from the sheep station we lived in in Australia. And then I came to WA and worked on the gold mines here and then went back to West New South Wales where I worked for a big cotton company, set up my own business, doing bookkeeping and teaching at TAFE. Um, And then I got really, really crook. I ended up with chronic fatigue. Right. And back then, I guess we're talking early 90s, chronic fatigue wasn't a thing. There was nothing nothing wrong with me. No. And I couldn't sleep even though I had chronic fatigue. (laughs) Yeah. And the doctor gave me a prescription for for 350 sleeping tablets. Um, Didn't check my mental health, but I wasn't going to pop them all at once. And my mum was actually really worried about me because I really wasn't very well. And those country towns, it has a huge drinking culture, a huge partying culture, and I just couldn't keep up, but I kept pushing myself because everyone else could do it. And I was just getting more and more unwell. And I ended up, mum in desperation sent me to Camp Eden on the Gold Coast. Mm -hmm. And I did two weeks there, which was 
absolutely amazing. And anyway, they recognised that I probably had chronic fatigue. So they put me in touch with a doctor on the Gold Coast who was a doctor and a naturopath, yeah. which was pretty weird back then. So yeah. every, every week I'd send him urine and saliva samples and with good diet and, well, change of diet to help fix my pancreas um, and a heap of supplements and other things, I started to get better. Yeah. And I thought that that's when I, it wasn't until I was married that I thought, I actually think I want to study someone because I don't want other people to go through what I've gone through where yeah. there's nothing wrong with them. Mm. Um, because all the tests said I was fine, but far out I was, certainly wasn't functioning like, an, like a healthy person. And no. so I wanted a modality that was recognised and that was back in the days when the health fund recognised um, complementary therapies. Right. And kinesiology was one of them and it appealed to me because it was really holistic. Yeah. And... You know, looking back, if this wonderful Dr. Kevin Tracy had had the emotional component of it too, I know that I would have recovered much more quickly because I had a pretty traumatic childhood mm -hmm. and um, if the emotional and the physical and the chemical could have all been looked after together, yeah, I think it would have made a massive difference. But, you know, sometimes you have to go through these things so that you, I think it makes you a better therapist you know, I'm, I'm yeah. not like a Catholic priest who's handing out marriage advice. Um, I've actually <laughs> been, been there and yeah. done it and done the yeah. hard yards to get myself better. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's, that's what led me to kinesiology. Yeah. So what is kinesiology? Because there's probably lots of people that don't really know what, what it actually is. Oh, it's actually so hard to explain. There's a few <laughs> aspects of it. So basically yeah. we're energy as human yeah. beings. We've got 14 main meridians. On each meridian are organs, glands and muscles. And the meridians pass energy like an electrical circuit. Mm -hmm. So if we damage one meridian and we can do it chemically, physically or emotionally, yeah. the energy doesn't flow, which means that we're not functioning as well as we want to. So if I stab myself in the arm with a pen, that's on the lung meridian. So all the energy from that lung meridian is going to rush to that stab wound. I'm not going to die because we actually are quite tough and resilient. Yeah. But all the energy is going to rush there, which means that it can't pass the energy around the circle. So that's one part of it. Another part of it is um, we've got part of the brain called the common integrative area, which is where all our belief systems live. Yeah. And then we've got our subconscious, which I think is like two voices on our shoulders, that yeah. keep us in the belief system that we've developed. Yeah. So that's why if someone grows up in a family of domestic violence, their belief system is that's what a relationship looks like. So unless they consciously change that belief system, sub, their subconscious when they will go out and find a partner that's not going to treat them kindly. Mm. And then when that partner's not kind, they're going to go, yay, yeah, we've, lived to, we've kept her faith in her belief system. So mm. it's about going back and finding out what those belief systems are, how we wrote them, because they often get there in the first seven years of life mm. when we don't have the capacity to understand the big picture. So it makes sense if we go back and look at how a seven, you know, under seven-year-old may look at it, because we'll often our belief system will be dependent on our parents too. So mm. if we've got a mum that every time we fall over goes <gasps> and grabs us, we're actually going to be really frightened of falling over or hurting ourselves because mum's really frightened when that happens. Mm. So if you've got a more laid back mum who just closes her eyes and then opens one eye slowly to make sure that all limbs and everything are all, all still together. <laughs> Especially with boys. <laughs> yes, the kid's not going to be as frightened to take risks and things. So no. the belief system is it's not okay to fall over because I frighten my mum. So we can change that and understand where it came from. So I reckon that one of our roles as human beings in this life if we choose to be a parent is to parent better than we were parented mm. and that's not criticizing our parents but if we can keep making every generation a little bit more emotionally aware a little bit more um educated about health and that sort of thing then you know that's that's one bit one good thing we're doing for society i think yeah i was just going to say at the moment i feel like they're being bombarded by you know, that we aren't responsible for our own health and that you need to pass that responsibility on to someone else, you know. Well, it's the doctor's fault. If the tablets he gave you don't work, that's... And, you know, and, and a medical profession is fantastic and I get referrals 
from quite a few doctors for clients and you know I, I don't want to poo poo them but they don't study nutrition so you know and the gut and the brain are so closely linked that if someone's eating pro-inflammatory foods and lots of sugar and their gut microbiome is way out and their bacteria is all way out you know they can't function mentally as well so um and that's what i love about kinesiology is it it uses muscle testing to work out what's happening in the body and that bit does seem like witchcraft it is quite scientific but it actually is is quite it does seem a bit weird but um you know so someone comes in with a sore neck for example and it may be that they've hurt a muscle in their leg so yes. if that muscle's tight then the next one's pulling harder then the next one's pulling harder so the pain's up here but the problem's down there so um it's actually i i look I love it. I get so excited about doing the detective to work to work out. What, and it's not always super emotional. I mean, it could just be that you fell down steps. Yeah. And you don't have to overanalyze that. Mm. But we as women do like to and overanalyze you know, stuff, don't we? You back out because you, you fell down a step. It doesn't happen. Oh, of course we do. That's part of our job. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's basically what kinesiology is. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's very interesting and it often sounds like you're talking to yourself a lot when you're doing the process with your muscle testing. Oh, when, when you're working with a client. <laughs> when you're working with a client, um, yeah, you're kind of like... Bleh, 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 bleh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, every, every client is a mirror in some way. It's actually quite scary. Yes, yes. Well, I, I think that that's the thing. Like often we get people into our lives that are really mirroring us to try and maybe make us aware or teach teach us a lesson in some sort of way so they often say someone that's in front of you is that mirror of you and they're kind of there to yeah kind of provide some sort of lesson in life but you know? i find it's really interesting because people come in waves i remember one one six month period i had so many people that were caught up in religious cults and then you know you get a whole heap of people that um i don't know have had horrendous accidents you know they've been burnt they've been machete they've been in car accidents or something like that or you know and then you get a whole heap of people that have had a horrible sexual abuse or you know it's, and then you get a whole heap of people that have got a really bad parasitic overload in their gut mm. it doesn't it doesn't all come in, come in clumps but it's it's yeah. really interesting and i do ask myself if i'm getting a group of people in at once what's the reflection for you for me because there's always learning from every single person that comes through the door yeah yeah so you're doing muscle testing and you're really working on the subconscious mind aren't you yes and the belief system yes yeah yeah. and then and then giving tools to learn to reduce that stress so so i'm quite a visual person so if someone has for example say they were 10 and their dad left their dog died and they had to change schools they could have abandonment issues Mm. so what happens to them they're really scared of being abandoned so it's like there's a bucket of abandonment. So the more time you spend running around in that bucket, the deeper it gets. And sometimes it gets so deep that when you look up, you can't even see a pinprick of light. Yeah. So if we were going to have coffee together and say I'm the one with the abandonment issues and you're 10 minutes late, unless I'm aware of it, I can go straight to, of course, Deb wasn't, doesn't want to be my friend. Why would she want to be my friend? You're this, you're that. You know, she's abandoned you again. Yeah. Yeah. And that can be my default. But if I do the work on it, and if you've had no abandonment issues and I'm running late, I think we're actually both quite bad at running late at times. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, that you might say, oh, that's right, she had a doctor's appointment. Perhaps she's been kept waiting. Hmm. Like you, you'll go straight to, I wonder if there's a reason. I might just check and make sure she's okay. Oh, that's right, she said the battery in a car was getting a bit dicky. Yeah. I'll just ring and see if she's okay or if she wants me to order the coffee. Um so what we need to do is change the belief system that everyone's going to leave me. Mm. Um, and then when we can do that, the less time we spend in those buckets, the bottom of that bucket comes up. So if we do get back in it, it's only knee deep. And yeah. then we have the tools to choose to step out of that bucket instead of getting in so deep that we can't, we can't see our way, way out. out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And it is hard. We've all been at the bottom of those buckets at times and they're scary and they're deep and they're lonely and they're horrible. Mm. Um but when you can, when you awareness heals, so as soon as you become aware of what an old belief system and your habits around that are, you can catch them before you get in too deep. Yeah. And you can say that that's my old pattern. I'm going to choose not to go there anymore. 
Yeah, yeah. And do you do you reckon you kind of tend to find people coming to you? They feel like they've tried everything else. You know, yeah, you kind of, feel actually, like you're that that last resort person. Yeah, and that that places a lot more pressure too because mm. you don't want them to walk out thinking, "Oh, that was another bloody waste of that's an hour, an hour and a half. I'm never going to get back in my life." Mm. Mm. Um, so it does place a lot of pressure because they're a bit skeptical before they come. Yeah, often. Yeah. Remember, I had one person that came in, and um, I came out of my room. This is not a and and she was in the waiting room already, and she hobbled into the room, and I only saw oh no, I did see her a couple of times that she'd driven three hours to see me, and um, she walked out, and then she sent me a message that she'd been walking and then starting to jog, and I thought, well, that's good. You know, she had a bad back. I didn't realise that her husband had put her wheelchair from my waiting room into the car. Oh. She had a lot of emotional baggage <clears throat> and while we worked on the muscles and got the emotion out, like it really changed her life and that was such an eye-opener that we just hold on to so much stuff and her childhood hadn't actually been that that horrendous. No. But it was her perception and her interpretation of it. Yeah. That it got the, you don't, the trauma doesn't have to be sexual abuse. It doesn't have to be being beaten. It doesn't have to be being in a war zone. If you have a peaches and cream life, I remember another lady came to me because... They had a conference in one city and then they were flying overseas a few days later and she'd had a, a, a you know, a, a pretty pretty fantastic life and her problem was she didn't know how she was going to pack to go overseas from, from the conference that they were going on. And we brainstormed it and if she bought a second bathroom bag for everyone and had that packed, then it would be an easy, yeah. an easy transition. But that stress caused her just as much stress because that was as big as her stress got as someone who'd been sexually abused. So it's not actually the whole, oh, there's always someone worse off. Mm. It's quite a destructive thing to tell yourself because it's all relative. Yeah. And, and this woman was a mess. Yeah. You know, other people that have had lovely lives and they don't know what to put in their kids' lunch boxes. So you change the, you know, they wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning wondering how to make the kids' lunchbox exciting so the kids will eat it, especially when they've got boys because the boys are far too busy wanting to play sport than eat play lunch. And, you know, she thought that they were doomed to have not good lives if they didn't eat good lunch every day. But we, we could change her belief system to I'm so blessed that I actually have the resources to be able to provide my kids a good morning turn lunch. Mm. Um, and her husband actually rang in and thanked me for taking all the stress out of their lives and it was over school lunches so they're big wake-up calls to me that it doesn't actually have to be what most of us define as catastrophic to cause to cause us a lot of stress yeah yeah and I think that you can see that often in the um, households where people have grown up with the same you know same parents same same kind of lifestyle same everything but it's about the perception of what it is you know Mm -hmm. um and how you react to certain things that changes that whole idea of I was, you know, I had a terrible childhood or, you know, actually it wasn't that bad and my parents weren't that mm-hmm. bad. And so, you know, that's how you can see the difference. No, no sibling is the same and they're, the way they grow up is not the same even though they're right there. Well, how often do you sit with your siblings and say, oh, gosh, remember when that person came over and this and that happened? And guarantee the other siblings will say, no, it didn't happen that way. They weren't there. No, it wasn't May, it was December. And, and you'll all have a completely different picture. And I don't think the truth really matters. It's your perception of the truth. Yes, yeah. And then that, you know, really ingrains into your whole belief pattern and your systems and your organs. And um, and I, I agree that this is where we should be looking at integrating so much more of our care is, is to is that our belief patterns are often making us that sick, you know. That, Absolutely. And, and, and if you listen to Bruce Lipton and he talks about with his epigenetics and, um, you know, he, he was the first guy to really start looking into um, stem cell therapy and he's, he realised it's actually the environment and it's not necessarily just the, the room environment that you're in, but it's the environment that creates mm-hmm. disease and most diseases aren't actually genetic as such you know like not you know dna genetic it's because the way i see it is that the gen the genetics part comes in into the belief systems and that's why oh. like it's coming through a family as a family pattern but it's because families have very similar beliefs 
patterns and you know they're I'm growing sure up that, i'm sure that we do have miasms you know which is the wink the weak link in the dna chain so if you come from a, a history of tuberculosis in the families then your lung you're going to have lungs that aren't perhaps strong as someone who hasn't come from a tuberculosis background so you know if you know that you come from that and you choose to smoke it's probably not a really great decision no. yeah whereas if you've got really robust lungs not that smoking is good for anyone but you're going to tolerate that much better than someone that comes yes. from a weak yeah genetic yeah. so that you know that's um, impacting the environment system. you know you, you've got that stimulus the environment mm. is the stimulus the smoking is the stimulus to create that disease there are you know a mm. small portion that are definitely passed through but not um yeah and as, as he said i mind it's so powerful I, I remember reading that I think it was a Harvard study where there was a bunch of doctors and they had studied hypothermia and um, there was a medical student who, like all students, was broke so he couldn't have, he didn't want to waste his money on the train so he'd jump on a cargo and, I, you know, not a person train every yeah, day. Yeah. One day he jumped in a fridge van on the train and they got to the other end and when they opened the fridge pan he was dead. And what they think has happened is that he's taken the hypothermia study that he's done that day, he's jumped in the train carriage, realised he's in a fridge pan. It was England, so it's cold anyway. It wouldn't happen if you were in Broome. Um, <laughs> and he's done the calculation on how, how much he weighs, um, how cold he thought it might have been in the fridge pan, and he was dead at the other end and he was perfectly healthy when he hopped on that train. Jeez. Yeah, so sometimes a bit too much knowledge can be a problem. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he talked himself into yeah. it. I don't know how mm. many um, med students actually, like it's quite notorious, after, you know, going through nursing training, that it was almost like they had Munchausen's because every disease they studied, they figured that that's what they had and it can be because you can't. And so unless you, and when you're quite fresh at it, you're like, oh, I must have that until you can actually do that process of elimination of, well, no, <laughs> there's no way I could possibly have it because of this differential diagnosis process that you have to um, come up with what Absolutely. it actually is. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you find that with supplements. Once you start getting into supplements, you're reading all the information about it and you go, oh, I think I did see a black spot in front of my eye the other day. Maybe yeah. I need that supplement too. Yes. So suddenly you're taking 4,000 supplements because your knee hurt last week and, yeah, that one hair did snap. It must be brittle, so you must need more of this. So, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. working in that can, can sometimes not be your best best thing either. <laughs> and so how do you feel um, as, a, as a woman? Like, Do you find that mostly women are coming to use this sort of, you know, modality or is it a fairly mm -hmm. even split or does... The husband have to come it's to more, It's more women, but I am, I do see a lot of men. I've got a lot of um, veterans affairs men at the moment with PTSD. Oh, yeah. Um, men with bad backs that don't want to have surgery. They've been told that's the next step. And especially, the, you know, the ones that have been bull riding fencing contractors for 40 years and they have a bad back. Um, sometimes we have to brush over the emotional component because they don't, they're too manly to have emotions. Mm -hmm. So that's actually tricky, trying to get their emotional stuff um, dealt with. Yeah. So I've I've developed a few ways to to get into that that tough man psyche, I suppose. Yeah. Because they actually do have emotions, but yeah, God forbid you ever let anyone know that you have. So yeah, um, yeah it is definitely more women, and I find that women are the barometer of the family anyway. So if you if you help a mum. And I remember when I was first studying kinesiology, a very experienced person went to a conference or whatever and got up and talked. I went, oh, my God, that's my daughter. I need to get her in to see him. And I went up to him in the break and said, oh, are you taking new, new people? I've got a daughter and, you know, what you've described is her. And he said, I don't work with kids. And I went, that's disappointing. And he said, yeah, I find that in 90% of cases, if I fix the mum, the kid gets fixed. Interesting, isn't it? Thought, oh, mm. okay that's not yeah. cool yeah. um and it's actually true because if dad's in a bad mood at home no one really seems to care that much but if mum wakes up in a cow of a mood the mm. whole house is walking on eggshells yeah yeah um and if the mum decides she's going to look after herself 
you know, and I don't like to stereotype, but, you know, women are nurturers and, and, and men often aren't as nurturing. So if the woman starts looking after herself and starts looking after the kids, it seems to, to flow more than if the dad decides he wants to go on some health kick. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Agree. We, we, and we are really born. So we are the barometer of the family. And it does, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's why we have breasts and don't because, you know, they can't breastfeed as well as we can. And, and, and as much as some people want full-on equality, I'm, I, I'm not seeing in the near future men having babies or breastfeeding them. Mm. Um, these days we can never say never, but, you know, we've got to embrace that femininity and, and that wisdom. And, you know, women, as women, we're, we're, we're so good at, at multitasking and having so many things happening in our mind and, and, that, and it's interesting because the female organs are the heart, um, the lungs, all those ones that need to keep working, and the male organs are the intestines and the bowel and all those sort of things, which is often why a man, when he mows the lawn, has to come in and sit down and have a break, which is kind of what the bowel does, whereas the woman will finish the mowing and she'll realise that there's dirty towels on the back table when she comes in, so she'll walk them to the washing machine and then, you know, she'll just mm. keep going like the okay. heart and the other female organs have to do. So... We need to recognise those differences and celebrate them. It doesn't mean that we're weaker. And Sarah Jessica, Park, Sarah Jessica Parker said, um, a woman trying to be a man is a waste of a really good woman. Yeah, I agree. And I think that this is, um, we are so different and we are meant to be different. Like, otherwise, why were we created <laughs> differently? That's the way I see it. And <laughs> and it's not about, um, you know, I was doing a lecture yesterday and and made a comment, some, some oh, no offence to the, you know the male in the group and I'm like no this is not a, this is not to offend anyone this is just that it is a fact and that is how that is how we are um, you're born with certain parts and even you know even if those parts are decided to be removed you're you were still a genetic makeup of a female and that's how our body knows it so um you know so for me doing creatrix i can work with anyone that's been born with a uterus basically and if they've decided to um you know change who they are um it you can still work with them but if they were born with a penis then that's not who we can work with um even if you choose to have mm. that changed and become a female you weren't born with a uterus so it's, it's just every cell is made up in a you know every cell is different and it's there so we need to work with that cell and that kind of that memory of that cell and the way we were born so yeah it's not meant to be about being um yeah the equality we are different and and you know there's certain things there's no way I could do or would want to do compared to what my husband does you know it don't doesn't interest me well, no, and 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 it's interesting on the stations now and um you know when I was I was the only Jillaroo with 10 boys and all that sort of stuff because it wasn't a girl's job. And, you know, I did have to be able to lift heavy things and I did have to prove that I was as good at work that I could be equal. What wasn't taken into account that I might sit back for five minutes and say, okay, the tyre's flat on the car. We don't have a jack. How are we going to fix it? Because the boys would rush in and they just lift it, you know, because they've got that strength. Mm. But us girls would have to find a strategy. And it's interesting now when I look at my girls working on the stations, you know, it's often equal boys and girls in a, in a camp and they'll often send a girl with a boy because the girl will do the thinking <laughs> and the boy's happy to do the happy, heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. And it works beautifully. Yeah. And, the, you know, there's testosterone to make it a competition to see who can be the strongest fastest whatever whatever happens and mm. i i don't know i i hate that that we assume because we can't lift heavy things that we're a weaker sex but you know the thinking's pretty important mm. yeah yeah i agree and i and that thing about you know not stopping and i think that's why i delay getting out of bed as much as possible because i know as soon as your feet hit the floor you know you're not going to stop until the time your head hits the pillow again you know, you, do, you don't have that sit-down time because yeah. there is always that. And I think that's where a lot of women also can get into that overwhelm and that, that stress of things. It's such a common emotion for women to feel is that overwhelm because we are multitaskers and me, I'm purposely trying not to be a multitasker because it, it can get to that overwhelm feeling that you're all, you know, hey, can you do this? Can you do that? Can you, Plus you I think know? now we're... I think it's a cultural thing too now where we have a bit of a competition with busyness. Yes. You know, if you're not busy, you're not you're not good enough. Yes. 
and yeah. and that's crazy. But you know, you've still got to be functional. If you're out shopping, and you know, I always have had a magic present cupboard. So and I'm an opportunistic magic present cupboard yeah. shopper. <laughs> so that if I see a beautiful candle or something that age appropriate, I'll grab it, and then it's in the magic present cupboard because then I know that I don't have to panic when it's someone's birthday to rush out and buy that birthday gift and you know yeah. I've been completely disorganized and they come in they say I had a beautiful birthday breakfast I go oh yes hang on I'll just go and grab your birthday present you know <laughs> quick <laughs> wrap it up <laughs> and you've got the can and the thing sitting in the present cupboard absolutely so you know it is handy to be able to multitask even if it's just silly little things like that but um yeah we've got to embrace it we're pretty powerful beings yeah yeah, I agree. And so as a woman, what sort of challenges do you think you've had, you know, even like in business or um, setting up your own business? Did you find that you had any particular challenges or were they um, challenges that they put in, you put in front of yourself? Um, I don't think so because when I was growing up we had butcher shops, Dad had butcher shops, and in the 70s um, Dad decided that he'd go and set up beef futures in Sydney and we still had the butcher shops. So mum in the 70s would go and be the cattle buyer for the butcher shops. Mm -hmm. And she'd walk into the cattle yards and, oh, lovey, you don't want those ones. They're no good. You know, and people were really, really condescending to her. Oh. So I think I probably grew up thinking that that was bullshit, that women could do what men couldn't do. Mm. And, um, you know, because mum did it. And, and in drought, you know, we had to lock willow and everything for cattle and, um us girls just did it and you know from the age of eight I remember us kids being eight six and four and if we had to muster the place us three girls had to do it on our own there were no men around to do it so you know and if we didn't get all the cattle in we were in big trouble because there was no excuse for mismustering <laughs> so I I don't think I ever grew up with that but it's it's funny you say that because the other day I had to take my trailer in to get a rego check for WA plates and I had to back it somewhere and the man went oh love do you want me to back it for you and I felt like putting my hands on my hips and saying, mate, I used to be able to back a double road train. <laughs> like, and that was all those articulations. Don't give me I can't back a trailer. And, and I did feel a little bit indignant. I said, oh, no, it should be right. And I backed it perfectly, thank God. Um, <laughs> I imagine if you didn't. <laughs> and, I, and I remember driving the road train into a service station. I didn't actually have a licence, but my partner at the time was not well. So... I was driving and I drove into a service station and about two o'clock in the morning and a, a bus of Amish people had just driven in and I, you know, parked it next to the fuel bowser and got out and um, they all came up and they couldn't believe that a woman could drive a, a road train. And um, so I guess I have come up at, up against it, but, I've, you know, and when I was working in the gold mines, I was one, one of four women with 250 men. So I, I guess I've just not really worried about that and just got on with it yeah. and learnt to assert myself because, you know, and I've never been too precious about sexual harassment and stuff because I know that that's what boys are like and mm -hmm. you can choose to take it personally. Mm -hmm. You know, they're always going to talk about boobs and stuff and, yes, it's probably not right, but I chose not to get myself too overwhelmed with it and if people went too far, I'd say, mate, you know, back off, that's enough. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I just chose not to be too precious about that sort of stuff. So I guess, I don't know, no, I guess being a woman's never really been a big thing for me. I have had to work harder to prove myself, but yeah, I've had to do it all my life, I suppose, so it's just part of me. Yeah, yeah. And what about um, any of your own, own self-belief feelings? Um, I know so many common ones for women are, you know, I'm not good enough or I'm not worthy of this or... Um, you know, do you find that you've got any of those that pop up ever? Yeah, they used to be really, really bad. And one thing I used to be really frightened of was judgment from others. Yes. Um, and I remember tracing that back when we were studying kinesiology, we used to balance each other. And my my grandmother, well, my mum's mum is is Polish royalty. He actually even had a title and stuff. And and so my grandmother married into that and so yes. thought that she was royalty. And um, one of her beliefs was that, that people that ate trifle were common. And I remember I went to a five or six-year-old birthday party or something one day and they had trifle and I tasted it and I enjoyed it. And, oh, my God, I knew that I was bad. I was so nervous about going home in case they asked what food was there. Did I lie about the trifle? Did I lie about trying it? I didn't know what common meant. 
yeah. but I just knew it was really, really bad to be common. <laughs> and from that day forth, I was so scared of judgment. You know, what would those people at the party have done if, well, you know, if they'd seen me at Trifle or what sort of people was I hanging out with if they were making Trifle? And, you know, I was really, I was five or six, I was really worried about that. And, mm. and of course, you know, when we unpack those belief systems as an adult, you go, oh, my God, that is so ridiculous. People have been eating trifle for so long. God knows why my mother, maybe because jelly's cheap. I don't know. Maybe, um, maybe custard's made from leftover eggs. I don't, I don't know what the problem with, with trifle is. But, you know, they're the belief systems that can be so damaging. And I was really frightened of judgment from then. Yep. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't worry me anymore. If my yeah. grandmother was still alive, I'd probably make trifle every day just to, <laughs> to have a bit of a go at them. <laughs> yeah, I think judgment. Um, fear yeah, and of judgment. course I still get them popping up. Mm. Yep. Um, but, of course, I still get them popping up. But now I think I've been doing this work long enough that um, that I can catch myself, you know, when I'm knee deep in a bucket instead of, you know, running around endlessly in that bucket to make it deeper and deeper. There's yeah. not time. Sometimes I don't have a really shitty day. Yeah. You know, if I'm like that, I'll just say, okay, I'm going to indulge myself and I'm going to allow myself to be really sad for an hour. Yes. And and when you give yourself permission to do that, you often don't need to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think in, and you've got that little, okay, I can do it. I've got my hour and actually now I'm going. And I, I found that the other day for me. Um, and it's often around, you know, your cycle that, and you, I don't know why I want to cry all day. But I'm just going to go with it and the next day you're totally fine. And I think that's when you can be accepting of, you know, we do, we are emotional beings. Females are emotional beings. We're designed to be. And our cycle influences that. And you can work with your cycle rather than against it. You know, um, we have different, different times when we're, you know, more social. We have different times when we can think more clearly. We have different. And so even like around businesses, we can we can work our business around that, okay, well, this is going to be the week that I'm, you know, going to contact all those people because next week or the week after I actually probably don't want to talk to anyone and, and you know, that can alter mm. your vibrational energy as well of how they're going to respond Absolutely. to you too. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, and, yes, yet, you know, that's sync, the- that whole syncing up of the cycle with females and, you know, I obviously don't have that issue in my house because we're all, they're all boys. <laughs> But, you know, that's probably something that you experienced a bit with having girls in the house and um, that energy. Yeah, and absolutely, and just recognising it. You know, even the moon, I, I know that, mm. you know, everyone reacts differently around the moon and things too. And it's just taking everything into account and just, I think, just being gentle with yourself. Yeah. And, you know, half the population has periods. Well, not all at once, but, you know, and I'm so excited that the, the Australian of the Year this year is is talking about that more openly because it's not a weakness to have a period. If we didn't have periods, we wouldn't be able to have children. And, mm. you know, I don't know why we're so embarrassed about all that sort of stuff. And I think it's great now that I know that if I ever got my period at school, it was a secret and you'd never ask anyone for a pad or anything because how embarrassing that yeah. you had a period. Yeah. Whereas my girl now is so open about it. Yeah. Um, and and all the girls are, and I, I, I think that's really great. I do have a personal when, like, belief, though, in regards that I've just saw the other day that they're now making leggings designed to look like you've leached through. So <laughs> I'm very right. open to let's share that we've got it, but I'm not sure I want leggings that look like I've totally leaked through and that whole crutch is now red that no, might, no might be a bit far i think sometimes as humans we're pendulum swingers you know we like to hit one end of the pendulum when we like to hit the other before we can swing back in the middle and i'd say that's on this end of the pendulum <laughs> yeah um oh, that's <laughs> oh that, yeah that, that, i think that's taking it too far myself uh, yeah so. maybe i'm being a little bit um old and but what Sorry. I did when, when my girls got their first period is we actually celebrated and I bought them a lovely pair of earrings and we went out for dinner mm. um, because it's the next phase of their life. And I didn't want to do the whole thing, oh, shit, that's it for 30 years, you're stuffed now every month, you're going to lose a week of your life. <laughs> you know, and I didn't want them to have that yeah. belief system. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we all went out for a period dinner and um, I bought the girls a nice pair of earrings to celebrate the next phase of their life. Not that I wanted them to go and have babies anytime soon, no. but, um, you know, it was actually, I thought I'd take a completely different approach to it. Yeah. No, I like that approach. That's That sounds good. I won't ever have to worry about that, but... Um... 
Yeah, that's a great approach to take. We are, we are, I celebrate that we're women and I think that's wonderful. And I think maybe that's a great place to um, end, period, stop. <laughs> <laughs> and just thank you very much for your time and joining me on your true self. And, you know, you're such a woman of talent and I just love the energy that around you and I'm always grateful that you've entered my life and, and um, able to join us here even though we're my thousands of kilometres away now from each other. <laughs> no, well, and it has been lovely to, to catch up with you too, Deb, and um, I'm also very grateful that, that you guys popped into, into my life those few years ago because I know that we'll be friends for a lot longer. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you for joining me, Sarah. And um, so Sarah Moss, an amazing kinesiologist who's now residing in Derby that you can um, contact, look up, and um and i'm also doing online stuff now so i don't it doesn't need to be in person um covid has taught me that we can do zoomy catch-ups and sessions um with just as much with just as good a results as as in person brilliant okay that's great so men and women can go obviously i'm a little bit uh, only with women but um doing create tricks but our men also need help out there as well that's for sure dealing with all sorts of things that are going on and and just mentioning that there's you know to be able to even go and have any sort of mental health appointments these days is near on impossible and often huge waiting lists huge waiting lists um you know mm-hmm. so uh, do consider the alternatives that are out there and that we are really working with our belief systems and that will, you know, when you can work with that and improve that, that's actually going to improve your life, you know, unbelievably. Yeah. And if we can all raise our vibration a little bit, then that raises the vibration of those around us and then they can do the same. And and you've got that beautiful multi-level marketing plan where <laughs> yeah. one person can change a heap and, um, yeah, and, and there's no joining fees. So that's an extra bonus as well. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And That's free it. shipping. Mm. Yeah. A couple of, you know, notes of gratitude uh, at, at night time or in the morning is a great way to get your vibrational energy a little bit raised before you either go to sleep or start your day. It's, um, oh, there's so many tools and that's a really important so one. So many, yeah, yeah, gratitude. Mm. You, can't, you can't be angry and cross or whatever when you're in gratitude, so that's a really good starting point. So, yeah, thanks, Sarah, so much for joining us and enjoy your um, right, yeah. hot weather while I'm starting to get all rugged up again. <laughs> I might just go and jump in the pool. Oh, I heard the crow in the background and we're missing the geckos, but at the same time we have to embrace what we've got now as well. All right, thanks so much for joining me. Okay. All right, bye. Bye.